Hey, what's up guys? Tobin? This is going to be a quick one. It's going to be kind of fun. Uh, there's really no GIS involved, so if you're looking for GIS, you might want to leave now. I'm going to look a little bit at a connected government or e-government plan that we just did. Because I think the way we did it's kind of interesting and the way we presented it is kind of interesting. And if you're in an organization or a government or what have you that has you ever have anything to do with strategic plans, you know how terrible these things are. Uh, the group I was with, there were uh, four of us, all really, really bright folks. Um, joy to work with. Uh, I think we had all been a part of a strategic planning process at one point or another. Uh, some of us, us had been on multiple strategic plans for different things. So we had a lot of experience with strategic plans and the thing with strategic plans is they're all just terrible. They're just awful. And the way they're awful the most is that they're not effective. And if your organization has a strategic plan and you weren't the one that wrote it, uh, try to imagine in your head right now what your favorite part of that strategic plan was. Can you even think of any part of your strategic plan for your organization? For most people it'll be probably not and uh, that's why it is just of no utility. It's not effective. This is the document that is supposed to be setting the course for your entire organization or whatever that strategic plan scope is for. Most people, including the people in charge of that organization, probably couldn't name anything in the strategic plan unless they actually wrote it themselves. So they're generally just, a, the only thing you get out of the strategic planning process is you get to tell people that you have a strategic plan. So we were, the whole, all four of us were like not interested in that whatsoever. So we decided to do something a little different. We wanted to make a plan that was very, very concise. I mean, we wanted, uh, when I first laid out the first draft, I said, here's the first draft. It's two pages right now. I've written the word concision on a stick. If this goes beyond two pages, I reserve the right to beat you with it. So, but we're all on board on having it be very concise, have it be very action oriented, and make it ubiquitous. Make it a, a web page and a visualization. These things usually end up being Word documents that you make and then put on SharePoint, and SharePoint is kind of the place where Word documents go to die. No one's ever going to look at it again. So we had to make it a, a something that's ubiquitous. You can put it anywhere. You can print it. You can put it on screens. If you've got TV monitors in your conference rooms, you can just have it always on there. Uh, and very approachable. We also want to incorporate good design. Um, this is just something that government is terrible at. We, government generally doesn't even hire designers. They hire programmers that r really end up making some bad UI decisions, like me. But we wanted to incorporate good design. We wanted to make it just visually pretty and useful and approachable. Is pretty is a feature. The aesthetic quality of what you do affects your UI, your usability, and your overall, the success of your design. If you have great content, but your design and usability is, your aesthetic quality is atrocious, no one's going to read your content. If you have terrible content, but your uh, aesthetics are fantastic, some people are still going to read your content because your aesthetics are so fantastic. They're going to read your content and be disappointed, but at least they'll read it. So the aesthetic quality of what you do is very important. I think it's especially like from developer nerds like myself tends to get undersold where like it's functionality is everything. Functionality that is hard to approach is almost useless. So that was our whole philosophy. The other thing we want to do is make it very action oriented. We didn't want this kind of buzzword filled navel gazing document that um, no one really understands and then you send off to SharePoint to die. 
We wanted to make something that here's what we think connected government is. Here's our basic strategies, our philosophy toward connected government, if you will. And here's all the things we have done and are doing right now to affect that philosophy. I wanted to make that last part, the action, the critical piece of it. So, show you what we have, what we've done. And that is not it. Uh, I always have a hundred tabs open at any given time. Uh, here it is. Here is the plan. It starts out, as you can see, it's a very pretty kind of thing. Connected government plan, what is that? And we're, we're not going to read all this stuff. Uh, what the boundaries of, are of that, the types of interactions it covers, and the, the technology layers. And when connected government, when it comes to interaction and technology layers, it's pretty much everything. And the, uh, briefly, what are the benefits of this? Why in the world would you want to do this? So that is essentially the entire uh, 10 pages, first 10 pages of your normal e-government plan is that. Scroll down, and these are our strategies. We want to be open, responsive, modern, accessible, and we believe in governance. Uh, the governance was kind of, that was big from the IT crowd. Governance. And like, uh, from my perspective, that's the stuff I have to work around to get work done. But we put that in there anyway because some governance is necessary. So we got this big, pretty graphic because this is the main thing. The definition is nice, but strategies. This is the big main thing. You get this really pretty graphic and the big county seal. Down at the bottom, you have actions, and these are the things that we're actually are doing, or are going to do, or are done. You'll see what the action is. You'll see what the status is. Tags, and these are the interactions and layers that were up above. Um, not sure what the utility of having that there is, but we decided we wanted tags, so we put them there. Description of what that is. And eventually there's going to be a contact person, and that person will be responsible for ensuring that particular action gets done. And that's an important thing. Uh, when you put that on there, the first thing IT folks see is the glasses half empty side because IT folks are pessimistic generally by default. They'll go, this means that everybody's going to blame me when they look and see my name here. And it's, it's either not started or it's not done. The glasses half full side of that is people look here and they'll see this awesome thing I did and I'll look great. Now, both sides of those that coin are actually useful. People that are driven by praise and accomplishment, that glass is half full, drives them to do it. People that are driven by uh, shame and disappointment, that glass is half empty, drives them to do that. So in either case, it's, it's an effective way to get people to get things done, which is really what you want. The actions are just some basic little filtering here so we can get all, none of this stuff is done or completed or even thought to be a great idea yet. All are completed or in progress. And the whole thing is, this whole thing I threw together in, in a couple hours really. whole thing is responsive, so it'll scale right down to a single column on a phone. That's part of being ubiquitous. You want it to be accessible from anywhere. Desktops, phones, tablets. And it also applies some print styling, so when it prints, you see it removes all those borders and stuff and prints out in a neat readable layout. It even expands like Charmac.org was a link on the main page. It expands out so when you print hyperlinks and you get blue text there that doesn't really help you. So it expands all the stuff out. And most of that styling and all the responsiveness really all comes from Bootstrap. It's the Bootstrap responsive CSS. So, that's it. That's the entire plan. And not so, I mean, you're welcome to, I'll post a link to where this is to go look at the plan and, and look at the content, but it's really the, the design that I think is interesting. Um, what else am I going to tell you about this? It's basically uh, very little code. It's 
Uh, jQuery and Bootstrap and underscore. Underscore is being used for some of the cool stuff it does and for templating. Uh, this stuff just comes out in a little template. All the code for this is out on GitHub. I'll put links to all this, this stuff. So to, from a technology perspective, it's pretty straightforward. The only real interesting bits, I think, are uh, all of these actions come from, let me go, let's see. We just have a Google Docs spreadsheet or an email. We just have a Google Docs spreadsheet that has this, these, this stuff in it. And uh, so people can enter and update their stuff. And this little bit of PHP here, most of which came from uh, this link in the PHP file, Costanos on GitHub. You're awesome. Uh, most of it came from there. And it's actually just pulling that uh, Google Docs doc down as a CSV and then converting it to JSON and sending it back. So the the JavaScript code just hits this PHP file, which goes and gets that that CSV, converts it to JSON, sends it back as JSON so the JavaScript can, can use it easily. The only thing I really added to the script that Costanos, you're awesome, uh, did was a little bit of caching. It takes some time to uh, for your server to get out to Google Docs for Google Docs to send that back as a CSV and then to convert it. So this little bit of script right here essentially sets a cache time for 300 seconds or five minutes. And this is the beauty of um, people give PHP a hard time and, and rightfully so, it can be kind of ugly. It can be kind of beautiful too at times. And this little bit of code does local caching for you. It basically sets a cache time and it says if this file, if this local uh, docs, doc.csv does not exist or if the file time of that is greater than five minutes try to get the Google feed or that Google CSV and if you get it overwrite that file with the data from from Google and that's just like five lines of code does all that caching for you so you're not getting like 10 people hit it and it's got to go to Google 10 times and fetch it so it gives you some performance benefits and costs you like five minutes of lifetime but other than that it's just pretty basic PHP gets it gets the first row as an array and then the rest of the rows as an array and then just builds the JSON as that column header as the um, JSON key and then that value of that record as the value in you know what I mean. But that's basically the only real interesting part. Uh, the rest is all pretty much straight. Um, there's a click options for that, you know, the all, you know, the filtering the documents, and then here's where it goes and gets the JSON, and it's basically taking the the length and dividing it by two, and uh, depending on uh, where it is, it puts it in one column or the other because it does it in two columns. Pretty much, uh, that's it. Nothing really else to tell you. From a development standpoint, this is just a couple hours. And report loader. Oh, the only other interesting thing I found out is IE8 does not support the trim function. So you need to do a little string prototype if it does not exist. Uh, which, uh, IE. That's really it. Has a little function for that one template it loads. There's this uh, template loader that Gazler on GitHub, you're awesome Gazler, made that basically just caches that template in uh, local storage if it's available. Only thing I did to that is I added this little template name. That way if you're using this in different places on the same server, because your local storage is associated with a your server and not a particular folder on that server, 
using it in more than one place, then you're not having the caches all build on each other and invalidating each other and so forth. Technology's perspective, that's it. The only other thing I wanted to show you was how you build this great big circle. So I think this is kind of neat. And it's very, very easy. I've actually used this, this great circle carved up thing in a, in a number of posters and places and people just really like it. It's very, very easy. We're going to use Inkscape, which is uh, free and open source stuff, of course. This is very easy to build. I'll go through this a little quickly because this isn't an Inkscape whole tutorial, but you'll get the gist of it. First you want to make a circle. We'll just pick the circle, hold down control while we drag so we make it a, a uh, regular circle, not a weird ellipse. And it doesn't really matter what size it is at this point. Let's give it a different color. Now we'll make a second circle, a smaller circle. We'll give it a different color and put it in the middle. That's too big. That looks pretty good. Now we'll get out our alignment tools up here. And we'll pick this little circle first and hold down shift and pick the second circle. And we got our relative to, relative to last selected and we'll just center that circle up. Then we're going to take this big circle, and then pick the middle circle, then go to path, uh, difference. And now we've got our donut. Now what we need to do is make, uh, make these little arrow-like jags in our donut. So what we're going to do is we're going to get our rectangle. We're going to drag out our rectangle. That has to be wider than our donut here. Let's try it. Yeah, it's a, that's a good size. We're going to go, that's right now that's a rectangle object. We'll convert it to a path. We'll edit the path. Pick that top line, add a node, which puts right in the middle. Pick the bottom line, add another node. And we'll pick both those nodes, hold down control, and drag it up. And there's what we're going to use to carve out our little arrow-like stuff in our circle. So let's move that over to our circle. We want to align that with uh, horizontally about in the middle there. Now, what we're going to want to do is rotate that circle as we carve it up. So let's uh, pick that circle and we'll go ahead and bust out uh, A little transform dialog. So we get this, we're going to duplicate it because every time we do this um, difference it's going to take away that first object. Duplicate it and then we're going to pick the circle and that arrow and we're going to go path difference. Then we're going to take that circle and here it'll depend on how many sections of that circle you want. We'll make it simple and do three. 360, 3 into 360 is 120. So we're going to go rotate. We have that circle selected. 120. And apply. 120 degrees and apply. We'll take that arrow, duplicate it, pick the circle, pick the arrow, path difference or control minus if you're a keyboard ninja. Take that circle, rotate 120 again. Now, since we don't need this arrow anymore, we don't have to duplicate it. We'll just take the circle, arrow, uh, control, minus, and there's our circle with the jaggies in it. Let's duplicate that, and we'll make that circle, we'll get out our fill dialog, and we'll just make that all black and give it like a blur of three, and then we'll move it a little offset. And then we'll move it to the back. Now we've got a drop shadow. Let's take this top one and make that a gradient. Edit that gradient. First color we'll make uh, we'll make white. Second color we'll make first we'll up, make it non-opaque. 
and move the saturation all the way over and pick like a light gray. And that's that's how you make that whole circle. Then you can, you know, just put in your your text how you normally put in text. So it's that easy and Inkscape is really, really great. If you need a vector editor and you're not already married to slash purchased um, Illustrator or what have you, Inkscape's really, really good. So that's how that circle's made. That's the only graphic in that is this because doing it outside of a graphic would have been, for this it would have been borderline impossible. So that's how the whole thing's built. Now it's not really our strategic plan, connected government strategic plan yet. It's going to have to go for a, you know, the oversight committee and the over oversight committee and the undersight committee and the leadership team and the leadership of the leadership team and all that other wonderful bureaucracy that makes our government hum. Uh, so there's a good chance they'll look at this and go, you know, we'd really prefer an 80 page report we can send to SharePoint to die. That's always a possibility. But for now, I'm really proud of the work that those, our group did. And uh, there we go. That's responsive. And uh, I think it's an interesting approach to a strategic plan. Uh, the only one I've seen uh, Mm, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, gov.uk, their government digital services, did their design principles, which is kind of like a strategic document. They did it in one page on their website, and it described a principle, and then you can see an example of that principle. And that was kind of the inspiration I saw when I was first doing this, was, hey, we need a one-page simple and since it's a strategic plan, action-oriented kind of document. I think that's what we got. Anyway, uh, I thought that was fun. Um, you might not have. But we'll see where that goes. That code's all on GitHub. And feel free to have at it. And if you uh, get mired into, roped into a strategic planning process, the kinds of things, even if you don't do it this way, and there you may not want to, the kinds of things that we've been talking about, I say the royal we because I'm the only one talking here, um, incorporating good design, incorporating concision, make it ubiquitous and approachable, making it action oriented, are things to really think about. Because I think if you don't do that, your strategic plan, the only thing it will accomplish is you'll be able to say afterward that you have one. And that's a big waste of everyone's time. So, until next time, have a good weekend. Bye-bye.